Hi, this is Pastor Stephen Feinstein, and this is now the third video that I'm making um, discussing Al Mohler's book, He Is Not Silent. And if this is your first time jumping in on these, uh, my, my whole goal with this is since everybody is sheltering in place right now, I figure it's uh, it would be helpful if people got just short little talks on uh, theology, on Christian theology, on on what the Bible says about certain matters. And the way I decided um, what I'm going to talk about is I'm just going through a lot of my books in my personal library that I haven't read, and uh, I'm reading them, and then I'm talking about them. And so this is one thing that will encourage me to read some of the books that I haven't read, and at the same time, it'll help me pass on uh, some good biblical information to the rest of you guys. So I hope you're enjoying these, and uh, if you just keep watching, I'll keep uh, creating these um, these short videos. That being said, this is now my, my third um, talk on this book, and I'm going to finish it. Um, and my, my plan is just to go pretty fast through, through the information. So what we saw in the very first chapter of the book is what true worship is. And, and Dr. Moeller uses Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 to really just hammer it in. Worship is seeing God as God is, right? Seeing God for who God is. And we see God in his word. We see God in the Bible. And when you see the Lord for who he is, you see yourself as a sinner, okay? And then you see the need for atonement, and that only comes through Jesus Christ. And then once we, we've we received that gift, that reconciliation with God, then like Isaiah, we, we say to God, we respond. We're like, send me. I will go and I will tell others of you, Lord God, right? And so that's what the first chapter showed. And then after that, <clears throat> where uh, what Dr. Muller does is he tells, he tells us specifically and biblically um, what biblical preaching is, right? You have a lot of church. See, if the way we worship God is by seeing God for who he is, then preaching is going to be the centerpiece of that, right? But most churches, what they call preaching is not biblical preaching. Biblical preaching is a preaching of a specific kind called expository preaching. Expository preaching is where the text dictates the sermon. Okay, The point of the sermon is the point of the text. The structure of the text is the structure of the sermon. The application that comes out is what is derived from the text itself. It is not a preacher looking around at, at what people are worried about right now and then making a topical sermon to address that. That's not preaching. That's just a talk. Biblical preaching is expositional. It, it focuses on text of scripture, explains it, teaches it, gives all the necessary background, and then applies it. Okay, so in light of that, that's kind of where we ended last time. Pretty much what, what Al Mohler covers in the rest of the book are different, uh, I guess you could say, topics that relate to preaching. First and foremost, there, there's one more thing that has to be added to expository preaching, and it's that all sermons need to be part of the big meta narrative. And what I mean by that is that the scripture from Genesis to Revelation is one large, all-encompassing story that really all other stories and narratives um, are accountable to. Meaning it's the truth. The Bible's the truth. It presents a unified worldview. Now, worldview more or less answers questions like, where did we come from? Why is there something rather than nothing? What went wrong? How's it going to be fixed? And how's it all going to end? The Bible presents answers to all those, right? And likewise, the world presents its own answers, whether it be through evolution or naturalism, um, and their answers are wrong, right? The Bible and the Bible alone is God's word, and it tells us the, the, the truth on these matters. So the meta narrative of scripture has at least four, four big parts to it. Creation, God as the creator, the fall, that explains what went wrong. And if Christians understood the fall, then they would understand things like coronavirus. They would understand natural disasters. They wouldn't be like, where is God or why? They would understand because it's because of the fall. Okay, the, the third part is redemption. God did not have to save us, but he chose to save us because he wants us to not merely know him as creator, but to know him as redeemer. 
And so he has redeemed us through Jesus Christ. And, and the volume of scripture pours in and points to Jesus Christ. Every page of scripture in some way or another, as Spurgeon said, makes a beeline to the cross of Christ. And then once we understand redemption and that, that we who believe were saved because of the work of Christ, because of the election of the Father and the, the atonement of the Son and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, it, because of those things, we understand that also God has not just decided to save souls. He's gonna, con There's going to be a consummation to this all. The story ends far better than it began. There will be a new heavens and a new earth, far superior to uh, creation even before the fall. Right, And so the, the, the point is, every text of Scripture, when it's being preached, has to be fit into the story. Where does this fit? Creation, fall, redemption, or consummation, right? If you just explain a text and just apply it, but you don't put it where it fits in the grand story, then what your people get are a bunch of disjointed um, lessons, and they don't know how it all... Um, fits together, how it's all moving in God's direction. Okay, so so all preaching has to cover the meta narrative. It has to focus on it in some way. Um, and same thing when you're reading the Bible, brothers and sisters. When you're reading it, understand where each text you're reading fits. Are you to the left side of the cross or the right side of the cross? Is the text pointing forward to redemption or is it pointing backward to redemption? You know, those are important questions when, when you're looking at any given scripture and it helps you to rightly apply it and interpret it. Okay. Now, these days we, we live in what scholars call a postmodern society. Some say a post postmodern society. Um, and in the, one of the inherent traits of postmodernism is it rejects the idea of a meta narrative. They say there is no one grand story that, that unites them all. Uh, instead, you have little histories or little stories that are all equally valid because supposedly there's no such thing as truth. In fact, truth is just something that was created by, it's a social construct meant to keep those in power in power, and it's meant to oppress people. That's how postmoderns look at truth claims of truth. That's how they look at religious texts. It's, it's just a power play. And so what they've done is they've done a good job convincing society that there's no such thing as truth. Uh, what you believe is true to you. And if anybody tries to, to call you to accept something else, it's a bid for power. Um, and our society is, is bought into that. Um, so the very idea that we are calling people to a meta narrative, the, the, the worldview of scripture is already seen as suspicious by the world, which makes the task of preaching and the task of, of evangelizing people a lot harder. Because again, they hold to a view that, that the text in itself doesn't mean anything. You get to make it mean what you want it to mean. And so that's how they, they uh, could look at the Bible and say, well, even though the Bible speaks against homosexuality as a sin, uh, that's just a, a bid for power. I'm going to interpret it to say God is love and, and homosexuality is okay, or, or feminism is, is the way of the future, or radical Marxism, whatever the case, right? People are doing damage to the scripture because they don't believe the scripture has authority, because they don't believe in truth. And so when a preacher stands up in this society, or an evangelist, or you when you're talking to your loved ones who don't know Christ, um, they're very suspicious of the claim that the Bible is God's word. It's inerrant. It's infallible. Uh, th they suspect that as, as um, being a, a bid for power. And so we have to be very careful. That means the preaching and evangelism task, it means when you're telling people about Jesus, that there's got to be a, an element of apologetics. We are actually presenting the Bible as a worldview over against their way of thinking, which refutes it and calls them to repent of their blasphemous thinking. So as you preach a text or teach a text, or present a text, whether you're a preacher or just a small group leader, or you're just teaching your family at home, not only are you explaining it, not only are you applying it, not only are you fitting it in the big picture, but you're also showing how it is the truth and people need it, and everything else the world believes is a lie. And the world is now attacking the very authority of scripture itself. So we've got our task cut out for us. We definitely do.
A good example of what it's like to preach in a culture like ours is to look at Acts chapter 17, when Paul was preaching to the sophisticated philosophers in Athens. Um, that was the, the cultural and intellectual center of the Roman Empire. And, and Paul was disturbed when he saw how religiously and philosophically confused these people were. And so that, that burdening in his heart caused him to preach. And first what he did is he explained that God is creator, right? Because that's how the Bible starts. God is creator. And then after he establishes God is creator, he establishes redemption in Jesus Christ. Okay, and, and that's pretty much what we have to do. God created everything. His narrative is the narrative. If you question it, you're wrong. And what you need is redemption. And God, in his grace, offers that redemption. Every teaching of scripture should in some way focus on that. And we just need to, to really cling to that. Um, any given preacher, Dr. Moeller makes a, a great point. We have to believe what's in the Bible. It has to be our convictions. And when we uh, share these convictions, when we preach, we are preaching as though we know this is God's word and you need this. This is how God shapes the way his believers think. This is how God calls unbelievers into his marvelous light. It's through faithful preaching of his word, which causes us to see God, see our sin, see our need for redemption, and see our need to respond. And it happens when we preach convictionally, when, when we truly believe the word, and then talk and act like we believe the word. And if people could see the urgency in the preacher or the teacher or who's ever sharing the word, if they could see that urgency, it, that's just one more thing that, that shows them the authenticity of what, we are, of what we are saying. The last thing I'll say, or the second to last thing um, to, to sum up the book, is Dr. Moeller's right when he says there's an urgency to preaching, to evangelism, to any teaching of the word. The reason why there's an urgency is first, everybody's a sinner and all sinners need salvation. Second, that salvation only comes through the gospel. And third, people only believe the gospel if it's declared to them, right? So if everybody's doomed because of their sin, and yet the only way they could be redeemed from that is from the gospel, but the only way they could believe the gospel is if they first hear it, then that means we really have an urgency to get them the gospel. Otherwise, they are stuck in their sin. They have no hope in this world. They are trapped in their lie, right? They are completely deceived and they have no idea what's coming to them, what, what they deserve, which is the wrath of God. It is on us to bring them the truth. And so if we don't have an urgency, it makes me wonder, do we really believe the word ourselves? If we do believe the word and if we do believe God's holy and we believe people are sinners and we believe people need Christ and salvation's only through Christ and we believe the only way anyone will ever get it is if they hear the gospel. If we really believe that, then should we not be declaring the gospel to everyone we know? That's the point. And so if you're going to a church where that is not the heart of the preacher, and that's not what's happening on Sunday, then there's a problem. And if, if, if your heart's not to declare it to those you know are lost, there's a problem. So we need to repent of that, and we need to, to have the urgency that the Word requires us to have. If we really believe it, we'll have that urgency. Now the final thing that, uh, that I'll say about this is uh, Dr. Muller closes with a, a chapter on Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones and uses it as a parable to encourage us that, look, it's easy to get discouraged when we preach the word or share the gospel with the lost. And, and it seems like people don't change. A lot of times they don't listen. But listen, it, it's up to God to do the, that changing. We just have to be faithful when we preach. And the one thing God made clear to Ezekiel is if, if God is in your words as you're speaking his truth, then dry bones do hear and dry bones do come alive. So when we are preaching or teaching God's word or proclaiming the gospel faithfully, do understand it's not your power. It's God's power that's going to save people. He just requires you to speak faithfully. And if you do, he guarantees in many respects and many times Dry bones will hear. Dead hearts will come alive. And so think about the privilege that God has given us to be preachers and heralds of his word. 
Again, a church that does not preach his word expositionally in light of the meta narrative with an urgency and a mindset towards apologetics is a church that is not being faithful. Okay, so we try to do that at Sovereign Way Christian Church. I pray your church does the same thing. If they don't, press your pastors to do that. If they won't, go somewhere that will because you need to grow, right? And then all of us, we need to have the same mentality when it comes to declaring the gospel to the lost. So with that, that is that concludes the summary of the, Al Mohler's book, He Is Not Silent. A lot of wonderful biblical truth in it. I hope you've been encouraged and convicted and really like just uh, charged up to do what's right. And so next time I'll start a, a new book. And so with that, thank you very much for listening.